Welcome to a riveting journey through the corridors of legal wisdom with Associate Justice Mario Lopez, a luminary in the legal field and the distinguished chairman of the 2024 Bar's Examinations. Our focus today is a meticulously curated selection of five landmark cases from the impressive roster of over 150 cases presided over by Justice Lopez. These cases are not just decisions on paper, they are intricate narratives that shape the fabric of legal understanding and practice. Case 26. Step into the world of administrative law and government auditing. This case is a masterclass in the application and interpretation of legal statutes, offering a rare glimpse into the meticulous processes governing administrative procedures. Case 27. Dive into the pulsating heart of election laws. Here, the roles and powers of election-related government bodies are dissected, revealing the intricate legal framework that underpins the very essence of our democratic process. Case 28. Explore the constitutional landscape, especially in the context of government contracts and fiscal management. This case is a compelling study of the constitutional boundaries and ethical considerations inherent in governmental fiscal responsibilities. Case 29. Navigate the complex maze of criminal law. Through this case, you'll experience the subtleties of judicial interpretations and procedural nuances, essential for anyone seeking to master the art of criminal litigation. Case 30. Understand the legal intricacies of electoral candidacy. This case is a deep dive into the laws that govern the eligibility and disqualification of individuals vying for public office, offering critical insights into the legalities of electoral participation. As we unfold these cases, each a unique chapter in the vast book of law, we invite you to join us in this enlightening exploration. Whether you're a bar exam candidate, a legal enthusiast, or a curious mind seeking to understand the complexities of law, our content is tailored for you. Subscribe to our channel for a continuous stream of legal insights and in-depth analysis. Prepare for the bar exams with us, or simply enrich your understanding of the law. Together, let's delve into the depths of legal wisdom imparted by Associate Justice Mario Lopez. Stay tuned, subscribe, and be part of this enriching legal voyage. Can a seafarer won a major disability claim due to a delayed medical report in the Philippines? Learn it here in the decision of the Supreme Court in the case entitled Scanfil Maritime Services Inc. and or Crown Ship Management Inc. and or Jose Mario C. Bunag v. El Mario M. Centeno, GR No. 227,655 promulgated last April 27, 2022. This is the 26 out of 160 case penned by Associate Justice Mario Lopez, the 2024 Bar Exam Chairman. Subscribe to Law Requisites for more reviewers. Facts of the Case In March 2013, Scanfil Maritime Services Inc., on behalf of Crown Ship Management Inc., hired Al Mario Centeno as a mess person aboard M. V. Dimi Pos Topas. On September 26, 2013, Centeno suffered a fall from a ladder, resulting in a blunt head injury, blunt back injury, a lacerated scalp wound, and brain concussion. After initial treatment in Japan, he was repatriated to the Philippines on October 2, 2013. Scanfil referred Centeno to company-designated physicians who assessed his injury and recommended continued rehabilitation and medication. Despite treatment, Dr. Manuel Fidel M. Magdira, chosen by Centeno, deemed him permanently unfit for sea duties. Consequently, Centeno filed a complaint against Scanfil for permanent disability benefits in July 2014. The labor arbiter dismissed Centeno's complaint, citing the premature nature of the claim and the credibility of the medical examinations conducted by the company designated physicians. The National Labor Relations Commission, NLRC, affirmed this decision emphasizing the qualifications and thorough examination by the company-designated physicians. Centeno then appealed to the Court of Appeals, CA, which reversed the NLRC and labor arbiters' findings. The CA awarded Centeno permanent total disability benefits based on the CBA, along with moral and exemplary damages and attorney's fees, 
finding that the company designated physicians failed to issue a valid medical assessment within 120 days of Sentinel's repatriation. Scanfill elevated the case to the Supreme Court, arguing against the CA's decision and the applicability of the CBA. The Supreme Court partly agreed with Scanfill, finding that the company designated physicians failed to provide a valid medical assessment within the prescribed period, rendering Sentinel's disability permanent and total. However, the court deleted the awards for moral and exemplary damages while retaining attorneys' fees. Primary Issue and Decision The primary issue was whether Almario Centeno was entitled to permanent total disability benefits and other damages. The Supreme Court ruled partially in favor of Centeno, holding that his disability was considered permanent and total due to the failure of the company designated physicians to provide a valid medical assessment within the prescribed period. The court ordered Scanfill Maritime Services Inc. and related parties to pay Centeno US$125,000 as permanent total disability benefits and 10% of the total judgment award as attorney's fees. However, the court deleted the awards for moral and exemplary damages. Important Doctrines 1. 120-day rule for medical assessment. If a company-designated physician fails to provide a final medical assessment within 120 days of a seafarer's repatriation, the seafarer's disability becomes permanent and total. This doctrine was applied in the case, where the failure to provide a valid assessment within the specified time led to the ruling in favor of Centeno. 2. Non-binding nature of certificates of fitness for work. A certificate of fitness for work signed by a seafarer is not conclusive on their state of health. In this case, the court found that such a certificate, even when witnessed by a company-designated physician, does not definitively establish the seafarer's fitness for duty. 3. CBA Applicability The court affirmed the applicability of the CBA provisions in this case. It was determined that the CBA between ITF and Bremer Berriedurungsgesellschaft MBH and Company KG applied to Centeno, contrary to Scanfill's claim. 4. Deletion of moral and exemplary damages. The court held that without substantial evidence showing malice or bad faith, moral and exemplary damages should not be awarded. In this case, the difference of opinion on Centeno's medical condition and the failure to issue a timely and valid medical assessment did not equate to bad faith or malice on Scanfill's part. 's your town's boundary clear? Back in versus Supon's land dispute sets precedent. Learn how the Supreme Court settled this problem in the case entitled Municipality of Bakken, Benguet, herein represented by Mayor Fausto T. Labinio, Petitioner versus Municipality of Supon, Aloco Sur, herein represented by Mayor Fernando C. Quinton Sr., Respondent. GR number 241370. April 20, 2022. This is the 27th case out of 160 cases decided by Associate Justice Mario Lopez, the 2024 Philippine Bar Examination Chairman. Subscribe to learn more. Facts of the case The dispute revolved around a 1117.20 hectare land situated within the boundaries of Bakken, Benguet, and Supan, Aloko Sur. Initially, the Songgunyang Panlalawigan issued Joint Resolution No. 1, Series of 2014, awarding the land to Bakken. Supan contested this decision, leading to the Regional Trial Court, RTC, reversing the resolution and adjudicating the land to Supan. The Court of Appeals, CA, later affirmed the RTC's decision. Bakken based its claim on Act Numbers 1646 and 2877, arguing that these laws defined the boundaries between the municipalities. 
However, the RTC and CA found these laws insufficient for determining precise boundaries. Sugpan, on the other hand, presented maps and certifications showing the disputed area within its jurisdiction. These included an administrative map of Benguet, a land classification map, a topographic and administrative map of Ilocos Sur, and certifications from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the Department of Agrarian Reform. Furthermore, Sugpan established the existence of public schools and voting centers within the disputed area, indicating administrative control. In contrast, Bakken's evidence, consisting of Act Numbers 1646 and 2877, tax declarations, and voter registration lists, was deemed inadequate to establish the modified boundary line covering the disputed areas. Legal issue of the case The primary legal issue that reached the Supreme Court was the determination of territorial jurisdiction over a disputed 1,117.20 hectare parcel of land located between the municipality of Bakken, Benguet, and the municipality of Sugpan, Ilocos Sur. Supreme Court Decision The Supreme Court denied Bakken's petition upholding the CA and RTC's findings. The court noted that historical and legislative references used by Bakken did not provide clear delineation of boundaries. Sugpan's documentary evidence was deemed more credible and sufficient to establish territorial jurisdiction over the disputed area. Important doctrines 1. Preponderance of evidence in boundary disputes. The court highlighted the importance of preponderance of evidence in resolving boundary disputes. The evidence presented by Sugpan was considered more substantial and reliable compared to Bakken's historical references. 2. Territorial jurisdiction established by administrative control. The establishment of public institutions such as schools and voting centers within a disputed area can be indicative of a municipality's territorial jurisdiction. 3. Inadequacy of historical legislative acts for boundary delineation. The court found that historical legislative acts, like Act Numbers 1646 and 2877, were not precise enough to resolve modern boundary disputes between municipalities emphasizing the need for clear and specific boundary delineations. 4. Did Butuan city officials unjustly receive 8 million pesos? What did the Supreme Court say? Learn the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Antonietta Abella Mancio, et.al. versus Commission on Audit Proper and Commission on Audit Regional Office No. 13, Butuan City, GR No. 238940, April 19, 2022. This is 28 of the 160 cases decided by Associate Justice Mario Lopez, 2024 Bars Examination Chairman. Subscribe for more. Facts of the case The Department of Budget and Management, DBM, Regional Office 13 disapproved the EAM appropriation in the city of Butuan's 2000 annual budget, citing a violation of the Local Government Code, LGC, which prohibits appropriation similar to discretionary funds. The city's Songgunyang Panlangsad, SP, enacted an ordinance allowing EAM allowances despite the DBM's disapproval. Between 2004 and 2010, the city government continued granting EMEs. The COA Regional Office 13 issued several notices of disallowance, NDs, for EMEs paid during this period due to a lack of legal basis. Appeals against these NDs were denied, citing the DBM's legal opinion as valid and effective. The petitioners, as recipients of the disallowed EMEs, appealed to the COA proper, arguing their right to speedy disposition of cases and contending that they were not legally bound by the DBM legal opinion. They also claimed that the disallowances violated the city government's fiscal autonomy and invoked good faith as passive recipients to escape liability. 
the COA proper maintained that the resolution period was reasonable and that the DBM legal opinion was binding on the city and its officials. It argued that local government units, LGUs, must judiciously utilize public funds and that petitioners must refund the EMEs received without legal basis. Primary issue in the Supreme Court and decision. This case concerns the disallowance of extraordinary and miscellaneous expenses, EME, paid to city government of Butuan officials for 2004 to 2009, amounting to approximately P809908.66, and the corresponding legal and procedural issues arising from this disallowance. The Supreme Court found the petition lacked merit, dismissing it and affirming the COA proper's decisions. Important doctrines discussed. 1. Right to speedy disposition of cases. The court held that not every delay in the disposition of cases is arbitrary and a violation of the constitutional guarantee. The length of delay, reason for delay, assertion of the right, and prejudice resulting from delay are considered. 2. Local government fiscal autonomy. The court affirmed that local autonomy does not allow LGUs to spend revenues unrestrictedly. They are bound by state policies for judicious fund utilization and subject to oversight by the DBM and the COA. 3. Doctrine of unjust enrichment. In the context of government disbursements, no legal right is conferred to recipients of amounts sourced from public coffers without a legal basis. Recipients of disallowed amounts are generally liable to refund unless specific equitable considerations apply. Did you know the Supreme Court of the Philippines thwarted a major land transfer scheme in Manila Bay, safeguarding public domain laws? Learn how the Supreme Court made a decision about this matter entitled Central Bay Reclamation and Development Corporation v. Commission on Audit and the Philippine Reclamation Authority, GR No. 252940, April 5, 2022. This is the 29th of the 160 cases penned by Associate Justice Mario Lopez, the 2024 Bar Examination Chairman in the Philippine Bar Examinations. More reviewers just subscribe now. Facts of the case On March 30, 1999, the PRA entered into an amended joint venture agreement, JVA, with Central Bay for the development of the Freedom Islands and approximately 592.15 hectares of Manila Bay's foreshore and submerged areas. The agreement allowed Central Bay to own certain portions of these reclaimed areas. However, in a 2002 decision, the Supreme Court nullified this agreement for violating the constitutional provisions that prohibit the alienation of natural resources and the acquisition by private corporations of any kind of alienable land of the public domain. The court established that while the PRA could lease these lands to private corporations, it could not sell or transfer ownership to them. Moreover, the submerged areas of Manila Bay remained inalienable until classified as disposable and declared no longer needed for public service. Following the nullification, Central Bay sought reimbursement from the PRA for costs incurred in the project's implementation. A compromise was proposed, where PRA offered to reimburse the costs by transferring a portion of reclaimed land to a qualified assignee of Central Bay. However, the Commission on Audit, COA, disapproved this agreement, stating that the stipulation for land transfer circumvented the court's decision and the constitutional ban against corporate ownership of land. Central Bay argued that the land transfer was to a qualified individual and not to itself, challenging the COA's decision on the grounds of grave abuse of discretion. The COA, supported by the Office of the Solicitor General, countered that the compromise agreement contravened the constitutional ban. Primary issue in the Supreme Court The main issue was whether the compromise agreement between Central Bay and the PRA, involving the transfer of reclaimed land to a qualified assignee of Central Bay, 
circumvented the constitutional prohibition against private corporations acquiring alienable land of the public domain. Decision of the Supreme Court The Supreme Court dismissed Central Bay's petition, affirming the COA's decision. The court held that the compromise agreement was void ab initio as it was contrary to the constitutional prohibition against private corporations from acquiring alienable lands of the public domain. The court emphasized that a private corporation could not circumvent this prohibition by transferring the land to a qualified assignee. The court also noted that the agreement required congressional approval since the amount involved exceeded the threshold specified in the administrative code. Important doctrines discussed. 1. Prohibition against corporate ownership of alienable lands. Reinforce the constitutional provision that private corporations cannot own alienable lands of the public domain except through a lease, highlighting the absolute nature of this prohibition. 2. Principle of quantum meruit. Allowed Central Bay to claim reimbursement for the actual costs incurred in implementing the JVA provided that the claim is substantiated by supporting documents. 3. Void a flat initio contracts. Emphasize that contracts violating constitutional provisions are void from the beginning and cannot be legitimized through indirect methods like the assignment of rights to a qualified assignee. 4. Congressional approval for compromise agreements. Stated that agreements involving government funds exceeding a certain amount require congressional approval, as per the Administrative Code of 1987. 5. Assignment of rights. Clarified that an assignee cannot acquire greater rights than those of the assigner and cannot circumvent constitutional restrictions through assignment. Is financial power a must to run for office? See how a lone candidate fought the system and won in the Philippines' highest court. Learn about it in the case of Angelo Castro de Alban, Petitioner, versus Commission on Elections, Comelec, et.al. GR No. 243968, March 22, 2022. This is 30th case out of 160 cases decided by the 2024 Philippine Bar Exam Chairman and currently the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Honorable Mario Lopez. Subscribe now. Facts of the case Angelo Castro de Alban filed his COC for Senator in the May 13, 2019 elections as an independent candidate. The Comelec Law Department Motu Proprio filed a petition to declare de Alban a nuisance candidate, alleging he had no bona fide intent to run for public office and his candidacy would prevent a faithful determination of the electorate's true will. They also contended that de Alban lacked the financial capacity to sustain a nationwide campaign. On December 6, 2018, the Comelec First Division declared de Alban a nuisance candidate citing that he failed to establish the financial capacity for a nationwide campaign. De Alban argued that financial capacity is not a qualification for running for senator. The Comelec N Bank denied his motion for reconsideration. De Alban filed a petition for certiorari, challenging the constitutionality of Section 69 of the OEC and claiming that the Comelec had no legal or factual grounds to declare him a nuisance candidate based solely on his COC. primary issue in the Supreme Court. Whether the Comelec acted within its constitutional authority in declaring de Alban a nuisance candidate based on the alleged lack of financial capacity and political machinery. Decision of the Supreme Court The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Comelec's authority under Section 69 of the OEC but found that the Comelec had gravely abused its discretion in declaring de Alban a nuisance candidate. 
The court ruled that financial capacity is not a required qualification for running for public office and that the Comelec's reasoning lacked substantial evidence. Therefore, the resolution declaring de Alban a nuisance candidate was set aside. Important doctrines discussed. One nuisance candidates under Section 69 of OEC. The court upheld the Comelec's authority to motu proprio declare a candidate as a nuisance under specific circumstances, as outlined in Section 69 of the OEC. Two financial capacity not a qualification for candidacy. The court reiterated that financial capacity is not among the qualifications to run for public office, thus rejecting the Comelec's argument based on financial incapacity. 3. Procedural due process in election matters. The ruling emphasized the need for procedural due process in the exercise of Comelec's quasi-judicial functions, particularly in determining the bona fide intention of candidates. 4. Non-constitutionality of imposed financial qualifications. The court underscored that imposing financial qualifications on candidates would contradict the principles of a republican system and social justice. 5. Equal protection clause in election law. The decision highlighted the importance of applying election laws equally without unfairly targeting specific candidates based on assumptions of financial capacity or political machinery.